Kei Kamenishi is the last surviving member of the Vancouver Asahi, a Japanese-Canadian baseball club. The team was disbanded in 1942, when the Canadian government interned 21,000 Japanese Canadians, including every member of the Asahi. This is Kei's story. There's a book called A Tragedy of Democracy about the history of Japanese internment in Canada. It's written by a historian named Greg Robinson, who is a professor at the University of Quebec at Montreal. And Professor Robinson concludes the book with this really interesting quote. Do you, do you remember that off by heart? Yes, it's William Dean Howells, the famous novelist and uh, American social critic, who said what Americans love most is a tragedy with a happy ending. What, what did you take that to mean when you first read it? That means that Americans um, feel deeply about things and Canadians the same, but that they like their stories wrapped up neatly. And if, if you think that things work well in the end, that people will be able to understand them better. We want tragedies with happy endings, like a classic sports movie where the underdog faces adversity but then they win it all with a walk-off home run. In real life, things rarely work out that way. So I need to be kind of close. Is this okay if I do this? Oh yeah, sure. Kay, can I have you introduce yourself? Oh, my name is uh, uh, Kei Koichi Kaminishi, and uh, I was born in Vancouver, 1922, January 11th. Kay is 94 years old. He's friendly, delicate-looking. In the 1920s and 30s, when Kay was a kid, he lived right across the street from a ballpark called the Powell Street Grounds. This is home to Kay's heroes, an amateur baseball team called the Vancouver Asahi. Asahi plays, uh, you know, some weeknight or Sunday. I go right away to watch, and oh, you know, every Asahi game, I never missed it. Yeah. Were there, were there quite big crowds for those games? Well, you bet there. Oh, the, in, when the Asahi plays, the Japanese towns are empty. Picture a white jersey, a red sun on the sleeve, and the word Asahi swooped across the chest. This team is entirely Japanese-Canadian. And when the Asahi first start to play against white teams, they're reviled. People shout slurs at the team from the field, the stands, and the press box. But by the 1930s, the Asahi are the most popular team in the city. Kay remembers Japanese people and white people watching the games. You know, there's only a, like a grandstand accommodate maybe 200 people, that's about it. eh? So everybody uh, ran up on all the four corners of the street, six deep. So, you know, good two, three thousand People were watching the game every game at that time. Kay's father owns a profitable sawmill. His mother runs a boarding house. The Kamenishis are a wealthy family in a poor but vibrant part of town. Well, of course, Powell Street, Japanese uh, town was a, oh, it's a really uh, quite a town, you know. Got everything up there. So you don't have to go to outside of Powell Street to go shopping or do anything. When was your, what's your earliest memory of baseball? I was in the school baseball club and uh, wasn't a real good team, but we used to go turn, school to school tournament, you know, quite often. They called you the vacuum cleaner, is that right? <laughs> yeah, well, that's, uh, I usually don't miss it. That's why they could give me a nickname for a while, you know. K plays third base. He's quick and sure-handed. He goes to school in Japan as a child and plays in his school league, then in a church league in Vancouver. And finally, in 1939, when Kay is 17 years old, the Vancouver Asahi make an announcement. They pick up five rookies, and I was one of the rookies. Was it important to you to get picked up by Asahi? Is that something you wanted? Oh, that's a proud moment, you know. If you get into the Asahi team and put the uniforms on, well, you, uh, everybody thought you were a king or something, <laughs> you know. Real happy time. Yeah, except I was nervous for a while, you know. What were you, you nervous know? about? 
because uh, you know, we are representing that uh, you know Japanese community. So you know, if you miss something, there's not good rumors coming up. You see, so you gotta be careful. You know, you gotta be careful because there's a spotlight on you. If you miss a ground ball, it might reflect poorly on the whole community. The Asahi are a real dynasty by the time K makes the team. They had won a Japanese baseball championship in back-to-back years. But the Asahi don't look like a good team. At this time, the best baseball player in the world is a six-foot-two slugger named Joe DiMaggio. And many of Vancouver's white players are the off-brand version of DiMaggio. They're big, burly guys who aren't so fast but are strong enough to hit home runs. The Asahi are different. We were kind of small. We can't hit uh, too many homer or big hits. So only thing we have to <laughs> win is uh, stealing bases and buns and squeeze prey. The Vancouver Press call this brain ball. It's really all about bunting. Imagine you're standing in the batter's box and the pitcher throws the ball to the plate. Instead of swinging as hard as you can, you just sort of stick the bat out. The ball bounces across the infield. If you do it right, it will take the fielders just a little too long to pick it up and throw you out. Do you know who was the best bunter on the team? Well, actually, everybody did a good bunter. Were were you quite good? Oh, I was quite good, yeah. Kay spends most of his first season riding the bench as the team wins the Pacific Northwest Championship. He's a proud bench warmer, honored just to be on such a talented team. And only 17, his best playing years are all ahead of him. We hear that Vancouver was quite a racist place at this time. Was that was that true in your experience? Yes. Uh, you know, those people graduate uh, university, can't get no government job, no engineering jobs, and no voting uh, rights. If you work in a place, uh, you only get half the wages. So our well, parents, they, they have a tough time. Yeah. Japanese people can't vote in B.C., They can't sit with white people at the movie theaters. And for the most part, they live in racially segregated enclaves. Uh, You know, it's not called British Columbia for nothing. Uh, This is Greg Robinson again. He studies the history of Japanese Canadians. There's a kind of rawness to the racism that you don't get in the East. Uh, There are all of these whites who have gone all of this way to settle this new land, take it from the First Nations and from the black settlers and the others who have been there before and they want to build a white man's country. Kay's second season is set against an ominous backdrop. In 1940, Japan allies with Nazi Germany. White Vancouverites worry that their Japanese neighbors will be loyal to Japan, not Canada. So Prime Minister Mackenzie King takes action. He requires Japanese nationals and Japanese Canadians register with the government. Everyone over 16 is fingerprinted, photographed, and required to carry a registration card. I think that there was no special reason to suspect Japanese disloyalty. The buildup of racism, the buildup of suspicion, had very little to do with the facts on the ground. interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. The attack also was made on all naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. We take you now to Washington. The details are not available. Do you remember that day? I can't even remember, you know, that. I I heard that, uh, you know, Pearl Harbor bombing and uh, on the radio. That was so, not scared, but... uh, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. I don't think anything, you know. Well, a lot of rumors going on, you know. You, they come and pick you up and, you know, and uh, curfews and so on. A Japanese attack upon Pearl Harbor naturally would mean war. Such an attack would naturally bring a counterattack. I've heard various people's stories about the word filtering through of the attacks. Some people got word as they were leaving church. Some people... Uh, heard it on the radio when they were at home. A lot of people I know went home and were wondering, you know, what this is going to mean and also were, I think, taken over by 
a mixture of emotions, shame, uh, anger at Japan, uh, worry for their loved ones. Engaged in conference with Secretary of State Hull. Their appearance at the State Department on this Sunday afternoon emphasizes the gravity of the Far Eastern situation where hostilities now seem to be actually opening over the whole South Pacific. On February 23, 1942, Mackenzie King signs Order and Council 1486. The government of Canada now considers everyone of Japanese ancestry an enemy alien. It doesn't matter if you're a citizen, if you fought for Canada in the First World War, or if you are a star baseball player. You're the enemy. You have to evacuate the West Coast. We have to get away from Vancouver, 100 mile radius. Got to go out. I was hiding actually two months in my mom's rooming house. Eh? When you say you were hiding inside, do you mean like you didn't leave the house? That's for sure. I couldn't leave it. You don't know who's a, you know, detective or police, so I don't know. Meantime, if I get a cut by a RCMP, I have to go to uh, Ontario, prisoner's camp up there. Eventually, Kay and his mom flee to a town in northern BC called Lillooet. It's a small Japanese collective overseen by the RCMP. The government calls this a self-supporting community because Japanese Canadians are required to buy their own land. When Kay arrives, it's a completely different world. Living in the bank, we got everything, but up there, nothing there. Nothing there. No electricity? No electricity, no water. Well, get the buckets and go down to uh, Fraser River, you know. Well, it's just so muddy. Yarrow, you know. So, really tough time. When Kay says there's nothing there, he means nothing. It's just a plot of dirt at the foot of a mountain. Just imagine that for a second. Imagine your government passes a law forcing you to leave your city. You have to lease land somewhere else. You have to build a new house. And you have to fetch the dirty yellow water. And the most insulting thing is that there's a bridge at the edge of East Lillooet. On the other side of the bridge is a proper town with grocery stores, a theater, running water. We can go across the bridge and to go to the shopping or anything. Uh, storekeepers come get the order and they bring us the next day, you know. Things like that. You know. So it's like paying to be in, in a kind of prison. Yeah, 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 that's right. In 1943, the government starts to sell the property it confiscated from Japanese Canadians. This includes the Kamenishi Sawmill, which is supposed to be Kay's inheritance. See, my dad uh, started 1917, you know, so we had a quite a uh, big business up there. Custodian took over, uh, sold for a uh, little over $200,000, you know. And this father sold next year for a million dollars. Million dollars. What a difference between only for one year. Not fair. Really not fair. You know, they call enemies anyway, first of all. Why is that? We are born in Canada, and we don't do anything. I was getting mad for a while. Other people said, well, it's a war, that's why I can't help it, you know. But to me, I was born in Canada, and, you know, I went to Canadian school, and, you know, why uh, governments do things like that? Kay is in his early 20s, and he's stuck on the wrong side of the bridge with no end to the war in sight. He misses his home and his friends, and he misses baseball. So he decides to teach the kids in Lillooet how to play, it's a way to pass the time, and the RCMP seem to like watching them run drills. One day, Kay talks to one of the officers. And this policeman was a real uh, sportsman. So I told him that we have a softball team, and why don't you guys make one in town, eh? Let's play each other, you know? Oh, he said, that's a real good idea. So he made a, one team in town. I told him, that, let us go one time to play the game up there. 
and you guys come in east side and next week, you know, things like that go, let's go back and forth, you know. We start doing this, going back and forth. So that was the first time you crossed the bridge? Yeah, that's the first time you crossed the bridge with a half-ton truck, you know, <laughs> go go to town. How did it feel? Oh, it was really, oh, I thought, oh, well, now the freedom comes, you know. <laughs> that's the reason town people start uh, trusting us. And uh, we start going, we could go to town and shop and... Uh, and uh, there's a one theater there, you see. <laughs> we used to go watch the show on Friday night and so on, you know. So you, you desegregated Lillooet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sort of, you know, the break the barrier anyway. Yeah, you're the Jackie Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That's, uh, you know, that's a really uh, sports, you know, did that. People like tragedies with happy endings. Here's a happy ending. The Asahi reunite and make it to the Pacific Northwest Championship. The game is at home and fans pack the grandstand at the Powell Grounds one last time. The score is tied in the bottom of the ninth. There's two outs. The coach looks at Kay and nods. The proud benchwarmer is going to hit with the season on the line. Kay digs his cleats into the dirt. The wind up, the pitch. Kay swings and launches a long fly ball. It's going back. The crowd jumps to his feet. High and far over the fence in deep left field, and it's a home run. Except this never happened. After the war, Kay's life doesn't change all that much. He stays in Lillooet packing tomatoes for 25 cents an hour and later moves to Kamloops. Gradually, some things get better. Japanese Canadians get the right to vote in British Columbia. The Canadian government apologizes for internment and survivors get a redress payment. But Kay never moves back to Vancouver because there isn't much left there for him. Japantown isn't what it used to be and his mom's boarding house is gone. But most of all, the Asahi have been scattered across the country. There's a question that I want to ask, and I'm not really sure how to ask it. Um, The country treated you terribly. It's hard for me to imagine that I wouldn't still be angry about that. Do you still feel angry about what the country did to you, your family, and your friends? Uh, It was, I was hungry, but once uh, Canadian government apologized to us, you know, that's the time that we were Canadian again, you know. So I'm not hungry, uh, hungry anymore. Yeah. I, I'm, it's, it's very moving for me. That, that seems like it takes grace, you know? Yeah, I know, but no, I, I'm real Canadian now. Yeah, I'm happy, real happy. grounds today, Japanese cherry trees surround the park. They bloom every spring on the cusp of a new baseball season. But no teams play here anymore, and grass has grown over the infield dirt. There are no foul lines or base paths. Some things get better, but baseball in Vancouver has never been the same. We're going to leave it there. A Proud Bench Warmer was written and produced by myself, Sam Fenn, as well as Gordon Kadic, Alexander Kim, and Eli Yarhi. Fact checking by Lawrence Pinsky. Special thanks to David Gutnick for helping us with a tape sync. This documentary was produced by Cited and the Canadian Encyclopedia, which is a division of Historica Canada. It is broadcast with both groups' permission. If you want to hear more of my work, I have a show called Cited. You can find it at sightedpodcast.com. That's cited with a C. And if you would like to find out more about the Asahi, Japanese Canadians, or Japanese internment, visit the Canadian Encyclopedia.ca. Thank you for listening. <laughs>